Thank you for the opportunity to uh, talk about the research that we're doing with palatal disease at uh, Stanford uh, Children's, uh, Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. Uh, it's always a good way to start the morning with palatal research. So, um, you know, so bear with me the next 15 minutes. Uh, so I wanna report on the projects we completed with um, the support of the uh, seed grant and uh, including the project on the sex difference in pilonidal disease. So I wanna start with this slide, not because uh, Scotty Scheffler uh, made the news last week, uh, you know, having uh, some altercation with the police. Uh, Scotty Scheffler is a number one uh, 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 in the world in, uh, uh, in golf right now. And uh, this is an article from 2022. Uh, according to this article, uh, he uh, dropped the TMI bomb, and it could be the butt of jokes for years to come. Uh, and uh, this really encapsulates uh, the symptoms that we see uh, the patients present uh, with pilonidal disease, and also from the patient's perspective uh, of this uh, problem. So while playing at the Open Championship at St. Andrews, he said he suffered an infection at the top of his butt crack. Yeah, I didn't really, uh, didn't ever really plan on telling anybody, uh, he said. And that's, of course, very common in the patient, the teenage population that I see in palonidal disease, because um, the last thing the teenagers want to know, want to want to do is to tell their parents about their uh, about their problem in this area. Uh, it was really hard for me to bend down. It was hard to make the swing. Walking was actually extremely difficult. Uh, and I think we've all uh, experienced uh, patients coming in, uh, barely able to walk. Uh, he said, I don't know if any of you have ever had something like that. If you talk to somebody that does, it's, ex it's excruciatingly painful. It was brutal. Uh, and so this is a, a common uh, theme that a lot of patients that come to see us uh, will present. So um, from the uh, medical, uh, from our, from the medical perspective, um, the palatal disease starts in puberty uh, due to the different sex hormone changes. Uh, they can have these uh, pits in the midline here, the gluteal cleft. Oh, sorry. Like this. Oh, here we go. Um, pits in the midline here. And some of them have a draining sinus or granuloma off to the side. The friction and movement of the buttocks uh, can propel these loose hair into the sinuses and the uh, pilosebaceous glands can be stimulated by these sex hormones um, with the keratin distending the follicle, uh, developing folliculitis and forming abscess, which we've all seen before. Um, with these challenges, and uh, as we all know about treating pilonidal disease, we've all had uh, 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 these challenges where the patients keep coming back with recurrence. Uh, and uh, we identified that this is a need uh, at uh, our institution. So we decided to organize a specialty clinic specifically focusing on uh, pilonidal disease. And this was uh, founded in January, 2019. And we've uh, treated close to about 500 patients uh, in our database. Uh, and uh, we have we have uh, performed uh, uh, research on various aspects of it. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what we've done today. So the first we wanna make sure, uh, we want to do is to uh, quantify the, uh, uh, the suffering really that the patients have. Uh, so we look at the quality of life uh, for these patients, focusing on uh, four different activities that teenagers usually uh, do like going to school, um, playing sports, socializing, or even just daily activity. So we uh, uh, administered a questionnaire um, before the treatment um, and then after our standardized treatment, which I'll talk about uh, shortly. And then we have them uh, uh, score uh, how much the palatal disease has affected their lives. So uh, it's a bit of a busy slide, but basically the four different uh, activities that we looked at, and this is uh, before our treatment, uh, and then this is uh, after our treatment for each of these activities. And you can see that a significant number of these patients uh, before the treatment uh, report a moderate to severe effect uh, on their uh, 
on these uh, respective activities um, before the treatment of their pyelonidal disease. And you can see that after treatment, the majority of them really reported minimum effect on these uh, activities um, for their uh, uh, after treatment of their pyelonidal disease. So um, this is clearly an important uh, um, thing to do for the patients and really it, it really makes a big difference in their quality of life. So the, we have uh, developed a standardized protocol to uh, treat patients with pyelonidal disease. So all these patients, they come to our clinic and uh, the ones with an abscess, of course, get an incision and drainage procedure. Uh, the ones that are symptomatic, uh, we uh, perform a uh, pit excision, uh, or some people call it the Gibbs procedure, named after this Israeli surgeon who published a big uh, uh, series on that uh, many years ago. And all of them receive regular, uh, either manual epilation or laser epilation, uh, and then we track them um, uh, over time. Uh, and I've somehow convinced my partners who want to treat patients with pyelonidal disease to all follow this protocol. <laughs> uh, and uh, we looked at the different settings that, uh, uh, so we practice, some of us practice at uh, different network hospitals. Uh, and um, we compared the uh, patients who are treated at these, uh, at our network hospitals, um, and there are a few, uh, and also by all the surgeons um, that, have performed this uh, procedure. And uh, we found that there's no difference between where the patients are treated uh, and by um, different difference between who was doing the uh, procedure. And our overall uh, recurrence rate was about 8%. So laser epilation has been a big part of our protocol. Uh, and uh, we do this for uh, all our patients that uh, we follow. And we wanted to look into laser epilation and see um, the effect that it has uh, in the success rate of um, doing this. So this is just a, um, a slide, almost like a proof of concept where we uh, you know, uh, showed that the more treatments you do here on the y-axis, of course, you're gonna have more hair reduction. Uh, and so that's, um, uh, not surprising there. But what's important is that we found that with the uh, with more um, hair reduction, uh, the likelihood of recurrence goes down. And uh, you can see the 75% here um, at 75% hair reduction compared to the initial uh, presentation uh, of the patient, the probability of recurrence is really quite low. And this has actually been uh, corroborated by the recent uh, randomized control trial published in JAMA Surgery, um, looking at la adding laser epilation to standardized treatment. And, that was, and they were able to decrease uh, the recurrence uh, there. So as we do more and more uh, laser epilation in the clinic, uh, we started to uh, experience a lot of delays. Because um, as general surgeons, we don't usually do laser epilations in clinic. Uh, and our clinic, uh, as you can see, you know, uh, multiple uh, sessions of laser epilation per patient, you can really have to run a big clinic. So the patients are uh, uh, complaining about uh, delays, and, and we want to do a quality improvement process uh, for this. So we put together a uh, appointment ticket that every patient gets when they come to the clinic. And then we record the time it takes for uh, the shaving, the you know, prepping the patient and doing the laser uh, to improve our um, clinic uh, utilization. And we were able to find that with uh, over, uh, after observing over 1300 clinic visits, uh, our clinic visit length uh, started to, to get better. They get shorter. Uh, and the variation between uh, clinic um, visits start to become uh, less. And so patients were really, to, really able to control the, the flow of the patient and better utilization of our uh, clinic resources. So um, as we see more and more patients, we start to notice that there's a pattern of, uh, of presentation between uh, male and female patients we start to notice that there is a difference in how they uh, present. So um, we wanna look into that specifically um, 
and uh, and really uh, find out if there's, there's something there. So we prospectively collected uh, patient information from 2019 to 2022, including their demographics, their skin type, hair characteristic, uh, pain score, and recurrence rate. And they all undergo our standardized treatment protocol that I described, uh, including uh, regular uh, and manual and laser epilation with uh, uh, Gibbs procedure. And uh, we also collected all the pits that we uh, excised and uh, stained them for estrogen and androgen receptors. So we identified a total of 237 patients, about 127 male and 110 females, followed them for just under about a year. Uh, we found that they have similar recurrence rates between male and female patients, uh, and they had similar skin types between the two groups. Female patients presented younger than males. Uh, female patients had less hair amount, finer hair, and lighter color hair. And you can see at the initial presentation, female patients um, had less uh, drainage compared to the, uh, to the male patients, almost half uh, the, the number. And, high, and female patients had higher initial pain score compared to uh, male patients. Interestingly, the uh, male patients, you can see, had almost twice the number of patients uh, than female patients with these, what I call granuloma. So here's a picture of that. Uh, so we see this um, uh, quite often, um, just to this off the midline. Uh, and uh, male patients, and some people call this secondary sinus, uh, the male patients tend to have uh, twice as many uh, uh, patients with that than female patients. And we found that uh, uh, overwhelmingly 62% of these are just to the left of the midline. Uh, and this is the interesting uh, finding we had. About a third of our female patients report that they have pain at the gluteal cleft uh, associated with their menstruation. It's usually uh, right before their period starts or even during. Uh, and interestingly, about uh, all the uh, interestingly, uh, all the female patients are on oral contraceptives. None of them really reported having this menstruation-related pain. And if you look at their pain score, female patients who are on oral contraceptives had lower pain score than those female patients that are not on oral contraceptives. We took all the pits and we stained them for the estrogen and androgen receptors, and we separated them according to whether they have menstruation-related pain uh, uh, or not. Uh, you can see these stainings that we did. Um, and we found that the uh, um, female patients with menstruation-related gluteal cleft pain, for example, in this red box here, uh, they have higher expression of estrogen receptor compared to the female patients uh, without this menstruation-related gluteal cleft pain. And this pattern was also um, found in the staining of for, uh, for androgen receptor as well. So female patients with uh, menstruation-related gluteal cleft pain had higher uh, percentage of their fibroblasts stain positive for um, androgen receptor compared to the females that don't have uh, this menstruation-related pain. Uh, and this is just another way of showing the data. Um, you can see the closed uh, red dots are the female patients with uh, this menses related pain, and they have a higher positivity for androgen receptor and estrogen receptor. Uh, and then the open circle are the females without this pain, uh, and they have lower positive, the positivity for estrogen and androgen uh, receptor. And the male patients just have higher um, uh, positivity for androgen receptor and not for estrogen receptor. So in summary, we found that male and female pilonidal patients present differently in their pain intensity, drainage, and this granuloma formation. And female patients can have this gluteal cleft pain related to menstruation. And this pain can possibly be ameliorated by hormonal contraceptives. And more fibroblasts with estrogen and androgen receptor expression could be a potential mechanism for this uh, uh, menstruation-related gluteal cleft pain. And females with menstruation-related gluteal cleft pain may not require surgical excision.
So I um, did eventually get that work published, but it was very challenging to get that work published. Um, and I want to put up this, uh, this uh, short excerpt from a reviewer from a major surgical journal. And you can see there's certainly biases uh, that are present for this work. Uh, this reviewer says that it's been suggested that boys are worse than girls at cleanliness or attention to the pilonidal region. Boys ignore their problem. This may explain why girls present earlier than boys. They're more eager to resolve their disease. This may, this may also explain why prevalence is lower in older girls. They take better care of themselves over time. So um, needless to say, the paper was not accepted at this journal here. Um, so uh, future direction for our work, uh, we are interested in the mechanism for the sex difference that we found. Um, we think it's quite interesting and it's actually, I think it's local, uh, a local uh, issue versus a systemic issue. Um, we have put together a classification system for pilonidal disease. Uh, I think for a long time, we continue to argue about recurrence rates, but we don't really separate them, the ones with mild disease from severe disease. So. Uh, it's not really comparing this uh, apples to apples, orange to orange. So um, I think it's important to have this classification system we, which we have put together. Um, we also see that there are a lot of pathologies at the gluteal cleft that are not pilonidal disease. And we've developed an algorithm um, to help the uh, clinicians distinguish between them. And as we get more and more referrals to our patients, we start to get patients who have been treated multiple times at other uh, institutions uh, or other surgeons, and the, I call them treatment-resistant pilonidal disease. And uh, um, we've been able to heal all of them. Uh, and so we've been uh, looking at our um, data and uh, trying to develop a strategy for a uh, standardized strategy for that. And of course, focusing on non-operative management uh, of certain patients. So with that, I wanna thank you for your attention and thank you for, thank you for the support uh, from the SEED grant uh, for this work. And thank you.